Climate change is likely to dominate our future and it is essential that we all understand our options. And for this, everybody should study the broad scientific evidence and be alive to the lessons of history. This suggests that public policy, shaped solely by popular misapprehensions, is likely to have very unfortunate consequences. I spent the last 15 years looking into the question of the in, uh, that which the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change has decided not to look at. Energy questions that face mankind, there have been three turning points in history. The domestication of fire, 750,000 years ago, the Industrial Revolution, 250 years ago, and the situation we're in now, climate change and the need to switch energy again. Each requires a balance between fear, safety, study and survival. And the first question that I want to look at is, what can we learn from the first two turning points as we decide what to do about the third? The first turning point, uh, men and animals were afraid of fire, but uniquely man used his brain, studied the fire, tamed it and educated his children to use it safely. And in this way, mankind gained supremacy over all the other creatures. By the safer green route, uh, as the environmentalists would have said 750,000 years ago, uh, they, they were condemned to cold and died out without the benefits of cooked food. Their sources of energy in those days derived indirectly from the sun. There's water, wind solar and combustion of vegetation, biofuels. But the energy density of these sources is extremely low. It's easy to calculate what the energy of a kilogram of blowing wind is or of one kilogram of water behind a dam. These kinds of calculations give you factors of a thousand joules per kilogram. So it takes vast plants to sustain uh, even a low impoverished population. In those days at least, nature remained relatively unspoilt. But then the Industrial Revolution came, turning point two. And this brought coal and steam, oil and gas, 20,000 times the energy density, that is the energy from a kilogram of coal, and it was available 24-7, anywhere, uh, and living standards rose, steel replaced wood, industry was powered, steam replaced sail, uh, uh, and the only thing that everybody forgot about was emissions. And that wasn't apparently serious until relatively recently. But then, with the understanding that the emission, atmospheric emissions of carbon dioxide and other gases really are rather uh, important, we reach the third turning point, at which point we realise that carbon must be curtailed. We could go back to the renewables, but they're still weak and they're still intermittent, as they always were, we may get better at harvesting. Their weakness means harvesting on a huge scale. This is a picture on a government report of a field outside Abingdon in which solar panels completely cover the green meadows. Similar photographs, uh, similar photographs of wind farms, hydro, the Three Gorges Dam project, involved the displacement of 1.3 million people. In addition, renewables are ill-prepared for the extreme weather that climate change uh, brings. And the, also shown here is the flood resulting from the collapse of a dam in Laos, uh, displacing a large number of people. A recent report that came out this week, in fact, uh, was published in the Proceedings National Academy of Sciences, 
tells what is happening to dams around the world. Hydro is supposedly the most reliable and uh, sustainable of the uh, renewable energies. But this explains that it is not so. Uh, I won't read all this, but he explains that, uh, that Europe uh, and America has been closing down hydroelectric dams because they are not sustainable and they're dangerous. 3,450 <coughs> dams have been removed to date in Sweden, Spain, Portugal, the United Kingdom, Switzerland and France. Hundreds of dams were removed in the United States and the plans to put them in the Amazon, the Congo and the Mekong uh, are extremely, extremely dangerous. He says here, large dams seem to be everything that, the, that one should not try to build if one cares about sustainability. Uh, and uh, he goes on to uh, detail some of the problems uh, in, on the Amazon in Brazil. So if renewables are not acceptable for a, on a large, for a large-scale expansion uh, and carbon fuels are not usable, what are we left with? Well, we're left with nuclear, and that means uranium, thorium, or fusion. Well, uranium power uh, is available now, Thorium will soon, and fusion definitely will, but not yet. The plants can be compact, robust, available, producing energy 24-7. They can be built anywhere, uh, and they secure fuel supplies, uh, and there is no <coughs> environmental impact at all. You're going to object to some of the things I'm going to say, but I haven't finished my talk yet. For example, you may not know that in Hurricane Harvey, the nuclear plant in Texas went on producing energy, electricity, 100% of the time, right the way through the hurricane. But, as the bottom right-hand corner of this table shows, nuclear frightens people, and they are taught nothing about it at school, uh, and public education lets them down, and the result is a very serious problem. <coughs> the problem can be seen a bit in perspective if we look at the uh, data on electricity generation and where it comes from and its consumption. Now, in fact, this is available on the internet for essentially almost all countries, you can see, as we will in a minute, the flows from one country to another, where the energy comes from, uh, and so on. This is electrical energy, it's not available yet for heating and so on, but maybe that will come. This diagram uh, data shows one example for the United Kingdom in April 2018. The green stripe across the bottom of the lower trace uh, shows the contribution day by day, hour by hour, of nuclear. Uh, and you can see it is uniform. The demand goes up and down, and the blue, light blue, uh, uh, area shows the contribution of gas, which is desperately trying to jump up and down and follow the, the uh, supply, the demand, which has to be provided hour by hour. The contribution of solar, which is the light yellow in the plot, uh, and wind, which is red, uh, fluctuates wildly. <coughs> but it doesn't fluctuate when the demand fluctuates. It fluctuates on its own because of the wind and the uh, sun, because of, the, uh, of darkness and so on. Um, Biofuels, well, biofuels emit carbon. Uh, they involve the destruction of large uh, regions of, of uh, forest and so on around the world, and they should not be considered as a, as a uh, benign renewable in any way. So without gas, uh, what would we do? Well, 
you, if you had three times as much nuclear, then uh, you would have excess nuclear capacity uh, for a significant amount of the time because of the fluctuating demand, and you could use this to produce hydrogen, which can be introduced into the normal uh, gas supply instead of, of methane. Um, you can use it for desalination uh, and heating and so on when the demand is low. So there's a perfectly viable solution which depends on nuclear uh, essentially alone. Here's an example of another display, and in fact you can look at this display for the whole world, and it tells you uh, in the last five minutes what is the electricity consumption uh, country by country, uh, and on the uh, right there you see a bar chart which shows uh, where the electricity is coming from in this country when this was taken. In fact, it shows almost nothing from wind uh, and not from solar uh, either, but lots from nuclear uh, and a great deal from gas. Gas is all very well, but it is a carbon fuel, and the supply, which we use for heating as well, is not secure. Gas comes not only from the North Sea, but from Russia, Middle East, and the US. So much of Europe is the same. So this is not secure in the way that nuclear is secure in France uh, and indeed in much of Scandinavia, which is why they are shown green on this plot. So, we really do need nuclear. What are we going to do about the fact that everybody thinks that it's dangerous? Well, we'll have to find out about it. Is it dangerous? In my books, I look at everything all the sources that I've been able to find which look reliable. But today I will look at Chernobyl, Fukushima, Goiania, which you may not know about, but it's certainly uh, rather important, the use of radiation and nuclear technology in medical, in clinics, uh, and some animal studies. The Chernobyl accident in 1986, people expected thousands of deaths and a huge area which would be uninhabitable for years, and that was evacuated. What happened? Well, something was very wrong, because wildlife pictures coming back from uh, Chernobyl in recent years have shown wildlife which is thriving, uh, from the BBC, Discovery Channel, uh, and so on. The animals seem to be radioactive, but better off with no humans than they were before. Here is a pack of wolves which have adapted to life without humans very well. And wild horses, in this case they were introduced but have been thriving uh, in their new habitat. Here is a beautifully camouflaged red fox and here is a brown bear in the region which is uh, had not been photographed before, and a roe deer also beautifully camouflaged, and an elk, not exactly what you'd expect in an uninhabitable uh, place. Here is a lynx, beautifully camouflaged too, badgers, and a large number of wild boar. It's evident the animals, you might say the animals, must know something that we don't. But they know nothing, Dr. Watson might say to this. Quite so, Sherlock Holmes might reply. But we may know something that isn't true. Here's a red deer with superb antlers, just as we now consider what did happen to human lives at Chernobyl. Well, there are 43 cases where lives were lost due to radiation. 28 of the early firemen who went in to put the fire out got very high radiation doses indeed, uh, and 28 died. 15 cases of thyroid cancer uh, are known, admittedly statistical. Uh, but huge social damage 
was caused to the evacuees by the curse of being told that you have been irradiated. The animals didn't know they were irradiated, but the, uh, the humans were told they were, had been irradiated. The hopelessness, the alcoholism, the mental illness, all reported by the World Health Organization. And as reported in medical journals, 2,000 extra abortion procedures in Greece were carried out just because of the fear of the accident at Chernobyl. Something's gone very wrong. The predictions of many thousands of deaths from a wasteland is definitely not the case. Have we got it all wrong about radiation? Because that's what this suggests. Well, we're going to need a lot more data to be persuaded of that, and that's what we're going to do. Secondly, we need to understand why radiation, uh, were protected against radiation, if that is the case, because that's really surprising. Nobody has actually been saying that nothing happened at Chernobyl. It isn't anybody's job. But we should pursue it. Well, how about some more data? On the 28th of February 2011, there was another UN report on Chernobyl and uh, essentially repeating what I've just said and confirming it with the latest figures. Eleven days later, Fukushima happened. And since I'd already written my first book at this point, I was very keen to get some measurements of the, uh, the radiation levels at Fukushima. And I was able to write just a few days later, and even get it published, um, in, on the BBC that nobody would die uh, as a result of Fukushima. But my reassurance was largely ignored. The world press prefers fear, excitement and social destruction because it sells newspapers. Reassurance doesn't. It took the UN over a year to repeat what I had said uh, after a few days. Well, I've been over there four times, in fact. The first time I went in September 2011, uh, and I visited the evacuation zone and the surrounding region. I talked with doctors in the local hospitals where they were scanning the public for contamination, with local schoolmasters and with local mayors of the communities involved. Everywhere, there was ignorance about radiation, resulting in a loss of trust in science and in the competence of the authorities. In fact, a breakdown of uh, the civil structure as we know it. So, what did happen at Fukushima? Well, there was an earthquake and a tsunami. 18,800 people at least lost their lives. That was a natural disaster. And the second thing that happened uh, was there was a radiation accident. No life was lost. It was not a disaster. However, the administrative panic, inept evacuation, and suspension of nuclear power around the world was a socio-economic and environmental disaster worse than Chernobyl. It was caused by a lack of public education, not radiation. Many of the deaths from panic Evacuation occurred among the elderly in care homes, as this published data shows. The next accident of importance, in fact more important really, was the Goiania accident in 1987 in Brazil, where the, a radiotherapy unit was stolen from a disused clinic uh, and sold for scrap. The cesium-137 source split open and the children played with it and it emitted a pretty blue light and they took it into the kitchen, it got on their uh, skin and into their food. Cut a long story short, two weeks later people started feeling really rather ill, which is not surprising. 249 people were significantly contaminated, over 50 internally and four died 
in a few weeks. 28 had surgery for burns, but there have been zero cases of cancer that uh, appears to have a radiation origin in 25 years. Cases of mental health, alcoholism, depression, from the label being irradiated, all this happened like as at Fukushima and Chernobyl. Two women have had, who were contaminated, have had normal births, one of whom was pregnant at the time of the accident. In this table, each line uh, represents a measured cesium-137 internal radioactivity, which is one-tenth of the line above it. So as you go down the, the, the lines in the table, you're looking at a tenth of the, uh, of the dose. Goiania residents who, in the first two lines, more than half of them, or in fact half of them, uh, yes, just over half of them, were, were uh, uh, died of acute radiation syndrome. None of the 32,811 Fukushima residents who were scanned in the same way had a measured radioactivity from cesium-137, which was higher than four lines below those who had an accident. That is to say, the radiation levels uh, were 10,000 times smaller than those at Fukushima, which is a good reason for saying that none of the uh, of the public at Fukushima is in danger of, of uh, uh, being affected by the radiation. There's much more in that table, uh, but uh, we'll have to skip over it. But it's time to do some proper science, uh, not just looking at data and pictures. Let's look at the energy. The resting metabolic rate is one watt per kilogram. And this determines the safe level of energy used in MRI and ultrasound. By definition, a radiation level of one gray per second, or one sievert per second, because they're essentially the same thing, is one watt per kilogram. Now, an actual safe level for ionizing radiation, which really does cause a problem, is on the level of one sievert per year, which is smaller than the energy level for MRI and ultrasound by the number of seconds in a year. It's 30 nanowatts of energy. Question, why is radiation 30 million times smaller? Well, the answer is quantum theory. In fact, it's something that Einstein discovered in 1905. In fact, it's what he got his Nobel Prize for, the photoelectric effect, which is the statement that when radiation is absorbed, it is not absorbed uniformly all over materials, but as a series of bursts of quanta, uh, local bursts. Each burst can break or ionize a molecule, but the other molecules are not affected. So it's not a uniform and the damage that is done by radiation is by hitting just a small number of molecules and atoms. Very hard indeed, but the others not at all. So much for the physics and chemistry. After the radiation passes, you're left with a number of craters, if you like it. But then comes something rather important. Living tissue is alive. It responds to uh, these craters of these bursts of damage. When life began, radiation was several times higher than it is today. And so from the start, if life was to survive, it had to mend the damage itself uh, within the resources available. If there's too much damage, the resources are insufficient and some damage persists. This is the task of biology 
and the damage may be caused by radiation, it might equally cause, be caused by uh, oxidants uh, and uh, uh, by chemical damage. They're almost indistinguishable because they're just uh, broken uh, molecules and uh, atoms. So there is a threshold where the response becomes nonlinear, and that's when the resources in the cells and groups of cells run out. A dose-response curve of failure rate against dose, represented as a straight line, is a naive misuse of mathematics for a start. It's the so-called the LNT, linear no-threshold model, and the over-cautious precautionary principle. LNT is the source of the prediction of many deaths on paper at Chernobyl and Fukushima at low doses. Unfortunately, it's still used by safety authorities with awful legal and financial consequences. But real life is given by the blue curve where nature succeeds in, in coping with damage up to a point, up to, to a certain threshold. How does biology do this? Well, many people in this room probably know much more about this than I do, but let me uh, give a sketch. Biology works by creating many copies of everything that it does. And this allows the Darwinian principle to operate on two separate scales. On the first scale is the level of society, which can composed of many individual organisms. And these compete, communicate, sense, react, listen to seminars, etc., uh, on the macro scale. And they're refreshed by replacement on a birth, reproduction and death cycle, slowly. In each individual organism is composed of many cells, and these compete, communicate, sense what, what's going on, react to one another on the micro scale. Uh, and they are refreshed by replacement on the faster cell cycle. The micro scale is associated with the oxidation processes from oxidants and radiation, and it's countered by antioxidants, repair of the molecules, suicide of the cells, their replacement, the adaptation, and the monitoring by the immune police. But of course, many Nobel Prizes these days have been given by work in this general area. But three points to make. First of all, these failure curves are not mathematical. This is mathematics outside its comfort zone. Every individual, every circumstances, every day, that curve is different. And one should not expect fancy mathematics to do. The financial world gets a bloody nose from misusing mathematics uh, when uh, it thinks it knows where the stocks are going to go up and down, and biology is making the same mistake if it overuses mathematics. The second point is that biology does not need or want individuals, organisms like us, to worry about a microscaled attack and to engage in pro radiation protection for low and moderate radiation doses, all the same for oxygen, because that is already fully devolved to the cellular level. Failure at the cellular level usually alerts the individual by inflammation. It could be so much easier. It already is when we look at the way society deals with ultraviolet radiation, which we get, may get too much on uh, if we go uh, on our summer holidays. Ultraviolet, of course, is right next to X-rays in the um, in the in the spectrum. So the the numbers are different, but it's not dissimilar to to uh, nuclear radiation, uh, and it can cause cell death, uh, so that the skin peels away and has to be replaced. Or uh, in the longer term, uh, if immune failure, uh, it can give rise to skin cancer. So it's a, a model, if you like it, of of the kind of thing that does happen with nuclear radiation. However, we don't have the United Nations uh, committees telling us when we can go sunbathing. We do have, as in 
on this plastic bag a friendly uh, pharmacy in the high street which advises parents on looking after their children and this is what we should do uh, and this is a model for how we should be treating this part of, of uh, physics and biology. Actually, this is much more serious than, than nuclear radiation. There are 9,000 deaths from uh, skin cancer presumed uh, due to ultraviolet in the US uh, every year. That's not a small number. It's not quite as high as, as uh, death on the roads, but um, it's still significant. If we had sensible education and public health uh, to deal with nuclear radiation the way we have about ultraviolet radiation, many of our social problems uh, in this field would go away and we could get on with thinking about the real effects of climate change. For low and moderate levels of, of ionising radiation, the competition is between a tortoise and a hare. The hare regulates everybody uh, with laws and restrictions and frightens them, but provides no actual protection that after 60 years of radiation protection theory. The tortoise, meanwhile, actually mends the uh, effects of radiation and provides actual protection on the basis of 3.5 billion years of dynamic experience. There's the question of what what is the threshold? Well, it's not the same for all because uh, we're all different and uh, the, the state of our cells and their preparation are different. But we do need a single conservative figure for safety purposes. Then there's the effect of chronic irradiation because a lot of the radiation we receive is not uh, a single burst but is ongoing. In radiotherapy, it was found quite early on, in about, in about the 1920s, um, that a treatment dose spread over five or six weeks, if given as a single dose, could be fatal. A dose of five to ten greys is fatal. A local dose of one grey per day allows time for the cells to recover. And Anybody who's had radiotherapy knows how inconvenient it is to have to go back to the hospital day after day after day. What you're doing is allowing for the recovery uh, mechanisms, particularly of the, uh, of the tissue and the organs around the tumour, to recover. Meanwhile, the tumour gets hit a bit too hard uh, and... Uh, and dies. That's because they're almost always safe. But uh, I'm going to tell you about the dial painters and their lifelong radiation exposure that they got. I'm going to show you some data on dogs. There's lots more in my books, but I haven't got time to talk about this. And I haven't got time to talk about how we got into this dreadful mess, but it's all to do with politics and the Cold War and the fact that we were told we were brought up to be frightened of radiation because uh, that solved the, the, uh, the Cold War problem. And then there's the question of what to do about it, and I'll come back to that. Humans exposed to lifelong doses of radiation that actually damaged their health. What is the information on that? Not many sources. Anyway, between 1914 and 1950, the dials of watches and instruments were hand-painted with radium so that they could be seen in the dark. The painters licked the tip of their brushes for their finest work. The radium was then absorbed by their bones because it's got a chemistry like calcium and remained with them until they die, because the lifetime of, of radium is, what, 14,000 years or so. So it, it, uh, it, they get permanently radiated, irradiated after that. This slide gives the, some data on what happened to the people who, uh, had, who were exposed in this way. And since bone cancer is not all that common, the background levels are quite low. 
and so you can see that uh, 146 out of 191 painters who absorbed more than 10,000 milligrays, uh, 46 of them died of bone cancer. So this is very, very clear data. You don't have to do any fancy statistics. In 1926, the cause was diagnosed and they stopped licking their paintbrushes. And since then, after that, there were no further cases of bone cancer amongst the people who did this work. So this figure of 10,000 milligrays uh, is a fairly agree well agreed whole of life whole of body uh, dose. Take animals. Dogs live long enough to compare with humans when you're looking at a, um, a whole of life dose. Uh, you can do experiments on mice, they're easier, but of course they don't live long enough to make the comparison so convincing. Dogs that were fed 100 milligrays per month regularly throughout their life they show the same mortality as the controls who are not fed it uh, until up to about eight years. That's why I put the red, that red line shows that the two mortality curves don't diverge from one another until about where the red line is, which is about 9,000 milligrays, or that is to say about eight years of this treatment. This is similar to the dial painter threshold at 10,000 milligrays. There's no reason why they, they should have agreed quite that well, but it gives a good indication of what a whole-of-life threshold uh, might look like for a steady chronic dose. If you compare with the survivors who, of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, they, there is a, a threshold for them, which is an acute um, dose, of about 100 milligrays. So they're all in the same ballpark, and I'm not going to now in this... Uh, audience um, try to deal with the so what can we do how can we persuade people which includes all the professionals because a lot of people whose, whose professional lives are built around radiation protection and they're the people who know quite a lot but they've got a vested interest on keeping going because they've got mortgages and children to look after and all that sort of thing. So it's only a few crazy academics and people are going to look who actually are in a position to ask these kinds of questions. But let's look in history at somebody else who solved a similar kind of problem. And uh, Florence Nightingale is interesting because... Nobody wanted to hear in her day about what happened in military hospitals. But she knew that the soldiers were dying from infection, not from their wounds. And more importantly, she was an established, uh, an accomplished statistician. And she used her skills to force the evidence the evidence blinds generals and politicians of the day to change their view, and she succeeded. Now, we've got a similar kind of problem today to persuade people, leave the professional, the real professionals who have an interest in it, out of it. We've got to persuade our politicians and fellow academics and fellow students and everybody that nuclear is not the bad guy that uh, we were all brought up to. It's interesting how Florence Nightingale worked. The uh, diagrams that she drew and hand-painted and shoved under the noses of the politicians of the day, well, they were a bit like pie diagrams, only I won't go into the, into the, uh, into the details, but you can see how statistics, colour and diagrams are the way to get to people. So what can we do to show that radiation doses are... Because there's no good talking to people in the street about milligrays and so on. They don't know what you're talking about. Uh, so what can we do? Well, here's a diagram. This is my Nightingale-type graphic. 
The area of the overlaid circles described the monthly radiation describe monthly radiation doses. The red and yellow are the local doses received by a tumour and the surrounding tissue, which differs by a factor of about two, uh, in a normal radiotherapy treatment. The green circle is 100 milligrays per month, which the dogs and the dial painters and so on suggested is a safe dose under all, almost all circumstances when recovery doesn't fail. Interestingly, in 1934, which was the year that Mary Curie died, when radiation still, still didn't cause a hullabaloo, uh, the International Commission on Radiological Protection set up a, uh, a, a level of radiation dose considered safe which was 60% of my green circle, which is interesting because I didn't, when I drew, drew my green circle, I didn't know about this. Uh, so there's some agreement that something like the green circle is safe. On the green circle, you will see a tiny black dot, and that re represents one millisiever per year, which is what the housewives of Fukushima have been jumping up and screaming and about trying to persuade the government to, uh, to, uh, to use and which the uh, International Commission on Radiological Protection to appease public uh, views, that's what they recommend as well. So we've got to get away from the little black dot which is actually a thousand times smaller and get to the green one. If you, with the green one, nobody would have had to left home in Fukushima. Nobody would have had to panic. Nobody would have had to turn in power stations off. Uh, and we'd be looking at climate change with the tools that we actually have to look at now with relative equanimity and popular support. <coughs> Some conclusions. Radiological safety regulations should discard the use of that silly straight line, the LNT, and use a threshold, such as 60 milligrays per month, which is the 1934 figure. Public health reassurance should be given that lesser rates than this are not generally carcinogenic and that previous guidance based on LNT and ALARA, which is the as low as reasonably achievable uh, acronym, was misjudged and is withdrawn. The related cost reductions to nuclear technology and health services should be carried through as soon as possible. They're massive. I uh, take part in a medical physics um, uh, online email discussion service and people spend most of their time discussing compliance with regulation and health service costs of this, uh, this problem are very serious and so is the cost of building and the work, work uh, uh, practices and so on of building and operating nuclear power stations similarly. At least a factor of two in both cases could be, uh, could be made. And then a quiet point. A safe world is one that you understand personally. So all children should learn substantially more positive science with practical advice on radiation, just as they do for fire and sunbathing, for example. Because fire is much more dangerous than nuclear radiation because it's its chain, its chain reaction is difficult to control, as the people in California uh, uh, are realising as we speak. As fast as possible, countries should start a major programme in nuclear power with supporting public education. And a lot of the money that is saved uh, should go into the expansion of education. We need people to join SOAN. The problem is that I belong to a generation that's getting older and older. We've 
we've got to hand on to people whose whose problem this is going to be. So we're we're looking for students.